Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our, our masterclass um, workshop in Sleep in University Students. Um, thank you for taking your time out of your, your busy schedules to be with us today. Um, we really appreciate it. Silly. So before we t start this session, we'd like to acknowledge the Wajak Noongar people as traditional custodians on the land in which we're meeting today. Um, and to acknowledge elders past and present and those that are emerging as well. Um, we'd like to acknowledge that the Wajak Noongar remain the spiritual and cultural custodians on the land um, and continue to practice their values, culture, beliefs and knowledge. And I'd like to acknowledge those that have walked the land before us. So today's session um, has come about uh, because we have a, a new UWA mental health and wellbeing framework which was launched earlier this year and our framework um, seeks to adopt a whole of university approach to promoting and supporting student mental health and wellbeing. Uh, last year we ran an all of students survey and we got some feedback from students in terms of what um, information that they would like to have in order to support their wellbeing. And what came of that was a recognition that students want to hear more about a number of wellbeing topics and sleep came up as um, one of those top um, considerations for student wellbeing. We have the building blocks to wellbeing, so you'll see there, there's a range of strategies that we can um, implement to support our mental health and wellbeing. And we're going to spend most of today's session talking about sleep. And we're very lucky to have Dr. Celia Richardson here today from the School of um, Psychological Science to share her experience, knowledge and, um, and understanding about what really works for sleep, particularly among university students, and also some of the evidence base behind that. Thank you, Celia, for being here today. Let me just check so that audio is fine, everyone can hear me, perfect. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I absolutely love researching and talking all things sleep. Uh, so thanks for indulging me and coming here to listen um, all about uh, sleep in university students. So in terms of the talk today, I'll give a little bit of background about sleep in university students before covering some of the main determinants of sleep. And after that, I'll outline a number of key uh, sleep problems and strategies to improve your sleep. Um, maybe put up your hands, who's here to actually figure out how to improve their own sleep? Yeah, probably the majority of people here. So hopefully you'll be able to take some good tips um, from that. And then I'll tell you a little bit about a really novel uh, sleep intervention project that has been developed and is running here at UWA called Good Night Poor Sleep. And there'll be plenty of time for a Q&A at the end as well. So as I go through, I guess, a bit more of a lecture style um, talk about sleep at the start, feel free to stop me at any point if anything isn't clear or if you've got any questions. Um, but otherwise, you can keep it for the Q&A at the end. So I guess you're all university students, so none of this is going to be new to you, but university students encounter a range of different challenges that are very unique to this population that don't affect other populations. This includes having changes to your living arrangements, so perhaps you've moved in order to study um, or you've moved out of the family home to um, you know, living with friends or flatmates. And that creates, I guess, a lot of change. And particularly in relation to your sleep, I guess the people that you live with can have an impact upon your sleep as well. Maybe your housemates are making lots of noise and that's impacting you when you want to be sleeping, for example. Uh, moving into university, um, it also has a range of kind of social changes. So particularly for those that have moved from high school into university, you're meeting a lot of new friends and a lot of people who have the same sort of interests as you. So people who are studying the same sort of areas and same things that you're interested in. And um, I guess a lot of socialising that happens in university um, maybe centres around or involves substance use, so perhaps this leads to an increase in things like alcohol use as well, which can have an impact upon sleep. And as the importance of your peers and those social interactions kind of increase, the, in the dependence on your parents sort of decrease as well, and this can have an impact upon your sleep. 
There are also some biological changes that happen um, in particularly, I guess, young adults at university. Um, and these are sequelae that kind of um, keep impacting you from um, the onset of puberty onwards into sort of early adulthood. And so in particular, there's a couple of sleep processes that I'll tell you about in a minute. And there are these developmental changes or maturational changes that happen in these sleep processes as a result of puberty. There are also uh, financial pressures that university students face. So on top of studying, potentially you are working casually or part time or even full time and trying to juggle that as well. And um, that's also kind of exacerbated by this independence from parents as well. Hello. That's all right. Um, and of course, you'll all be aware of the academic pressures that university students face, and this can kind of ebb and flow across the semester as well. So hopefully you're not feeling too bad in sort of week four of semester, but definitely around assessment due dates, um, stress levels kind of go up, and this can have an impact on your sleep as well. So how do these things impact sleep? Well, one of the most simple theoretical models, uh, this is a model of insomnia, but I think it um, helps to show you how sleep disturbance can arise in the first place. This model is referred to as the 3P model. So the three Ps are predisposing factors, precipitating factors, and perpetuating factors. And this model basically suggests that in terms of our vulnerability to sleep problems, we all have a certain level of predisposition. So these are largely things that can't be changed. So so uh, things like your biological sex, um, so for example, um, females are more predisposed to sleep problems than males are. Um, age is another thing that predisposes you to sleep problems, so the older that we get, the more predisposed to sleep problems we are. And there are certain personality factors as well that might predispose someone to sleep problems more than another person, so things like your level of perfectionism or how predisposed you are to repetitive negative thinking and those sorts of processes. And then there's a perhaps a genetic link there as well. So things like insomnia tend to run in families. So there's this thought that there are genetic con contributors to the risk for sleep problems as well. So everybody brings a certain level of predisposition to sleep disturbance, but then this interacts with these uh, precipitating kind of events. So you can think of this as any sort of life stress. So any of those challenges that I went through that university students face, these are the sorts of life stresses that then can interact with your level of predisposition to sleep disturbance. And this can tip you over what's sort of called the insomnia threshold or the threshold for sleep disturbance where your sleep starts to become a bit of a problem. The third P refers to perpetuating factors. So even though it's the life stress that um, impacts your sleep to begin with, you can then engage in particular behaviors or ways of thinking about your sleep that then um, make the sleep problem get worse over time and it perpetuates the sleep problem over time. So um, this could be things like spending too long in bed. That's an example of an unhelpful behavior. Or you could have particular unhelpful beliefs about sleep. So for example, I have to get nine or 10 hours of sleep and potentially that's an unhelpful thought or belief to be having. So as psychologists, where we really targeting, targeting these um, perpetuating sort of factors in treatment for uh, sleep disturbance. And that's because you can see over time that life stress kind of um, gets better over time, but it's really those perpetuating factors that keep you experiencing sleep disturbance or insomnia. So as I've mentioned, there are all these sort of life stresses and reasons why university students might be more predisposed to experiencing disturbed sleep. And there is research that shows that about 60% of university students report poor sleep quality. Um, so it's uh, more prevalent than perhaps in other populations. And if you look at the particular types of sleep problems that have been reported, quite often, um, so 15% of university students report specifically having difficulties getting to sleep at the start of the night. And 26% report waking up frequently during the night and perhaps taking quite a long time to be able to get back to sleep as well. Um, so 8% uh, report having insomnia. And so that's sort of a combination of those uh, sleep uh, symptoms and I'll tell you a little bit more about what insomnia involves in a minute. Um, but of course there are other sleep related problems that are really common. So nightmares for example are fairly common in university students. 5% uh, of males report having common nightmares and 8% of females. So these are the sleep problems that are more associated with sleep disorders but of course the amount of sleep that we get is really important as well. So there was a study done in Australian university students and they estimated that most university students get between six and a half to eight hours of sleep. How many people think that you're within that age range in this group? A few. How many are sort of less than that do you think? 
few more. Yeah. Um, so they found that about a third obtained less than 6.4 hours of sleep. So that's quite a substantial number, sort of getting less um, than six and a half hours. But how much sleep do you actually need? Well, there is this really helpful infographic that was put together by the National Sleep Foundation, and this uh, outlines recommendations for how much sleep you should be aiming to get um, across the lifespan. So what you can see in the darker blue color is the amount of sleep that is recommended for each sort of age or developmental period. But they recognize that there's a huge amount of individual variability. So I'm sure just speaking to family members or friends, you know that um, perhaps there are people who need to get more sleep to feel good and function well during the day. And there are some people who kind of get away with getting less sleep and they still feel good and function well during the day. So this infographic helps to uh, pick up that individual difference. So in the more um, sort of aquary color at the bottom and at the top, this is the amount of sleep that might be appropriate for some people, but most people should be within this um, sort of blue band here. So I guess, like I've said, not all university students are young adults, but the vast majority would sort of fit in this, um, this period here. So the National Sleep Foundation would recommend that young adults get between seven to nine hours of sleep, but six may be appropriate for some people. And there might be some people who need closer to 10 to 11 hours of sleep to feel good and function well during the day. So with that other study, with about a third of uni students kind of being, I guess, in this category here, um, they're sort of overrepresented at the lower end of what's recommended. And for many of those people, I would say that they're not getting enough sleep um, than they need. So what? So who cares if you have uh, difficulty sleeping or are not getting enough sleep? Well, particularly relevant to university students, there is a link between uh, sleep and academic performance. So if you're not getting enough sleep, uh, you're more, I guess, predisposed to having lower GPA, so lower academic achievement, and it can affect your learning capacity as well. So we're still trying to learn exactly the ways that sleep is related to cognitive functions, but it can be really important for your ability to uh, remember important things, to be able to sustain your attention in class, to soak in all that important information, um, and other cognitive functions such as executive functioning as well. Uh, in this particular population, so in university students, suboptimal sleep is also linked to more risky health behaviours. Um, so if you don't sleep as well, you're more predisposed to using particular substances, so alcohol as well as smoking and drug use, um, and stimulant use as well. I guess stimulant use is a bit of a tricky one because if you're not sleeping well, then often you go for the coffee or whatever the next day to be able to overcome um, that sleep loss. But then if you have too many sort of stimulants during the day, that can remain in your body when it comes time to sleep and can prevent you from falling asleep and staying asleep. So stimulant use can be referring to caffeine? Yeah. So um, I'll give some advice kind of around caffeine use um, later on. <laughs> but I think, um, yeah, most people need sort of caffeine to get going, but particularly if you're having caffeine um, quite a lot during the day and quite late into the day as a way to kind of overcome that sleep loss, it can actually stay in your system um, when it comes time to go to bed. And then that can be something that prevents your body from physiologically de-arousing and getting into that state to be able to sleep for sure. But I guess there could also be, I don't know, study drugs and stuff like that that are stimulants as well that um, university students might be using and perhaps not thinking about the effect that that will have on sleep as well. Um, and of course, sleep has a really robust uh, relationship with mental health. So particularly, a lot of my work is done in adolescence, but the same sort of um, risk factors in adolescence carry through into younger university students. And so particularly in adolescence, sleep is a really robust risk factor for the onset of mental health problems like depression, anxiety, and even eating disorders, amongst other things. And so in university students, if you're not sleeping well, this has been linked to having a lower life satisfaction, lower overall self-efficacy and increased um, suicidal ideation as well. So these are all the reasons why you should be, I guess, prioritizing sleep as a university student. So what are the key determinants of sleep? Uh, well, there's another key theoretical model in the field that in, informs sleep psychology is called the two process model of sleep. And so the first of those two processes refers to sleep homeostasis. So you can refer to this as um, process S. Uh, basically what this refers to is your sleep drive. So how you build up sleepiness during the day and how you alleviate that feeling of sleepiness um, across the night. 
um, as a result of sleep. So you can think of your sleep drive much as you think of hunger drive. The longer you go without food, the hungrier you get, you start to have cravings and then you just kind of can't resist food because your body's telling you uh, you need to fuel you need to fuel me. So um, the same thing works with sleep. Uh, from the time that you wake up across your waking hours, you um, build up sleep pressure or basically the feeling of sleepiness. And when it reaches sort of a high point close to your normal bedtime, it's this feeling of sleepiness that helps you to fall asleep quickly and stay asleep across the night. So once you've fallen asleep, you pay back that sleep pressure or that sleep debt and your sleep sleepiness um, decreases across the night. And you can see if you have really nice regular bed and wake up times, there's this wave pattern kind of every day um, um, to kind of demonstrate that. And so, in terms of developmental changes that happen from adolescence right into um, early sort of adulthood, the rate that you build up that sleep pressure tends to slow. And that's one reason why teenagers perhaps want to go to bed a bit later because they take longer to build up that sleepy feeling um, to feel ready to be able to try to fall asleep. There are other behaviours that impact um, I guess how sleep pressure builds up and dissipates across the night. And one of those things is bed and wake up time. So you can see in this kind of maroni color, an example of what would happen if you pulled an all nighter. Um, basically you would just keep building up sleep pressure and that feeling of sleepiness, not quite at the same rate. It does sort of plateau somewhat. Um, but yeah, you'd be very, very sleepy, like with hunger when you start to have cravings for food and things like that. I guess with sleep, you would start to have micro sleeps. It would be very, very hard to keep your eyes open. Um, yeah. So that's an example of what happens when you go without sleep. Um, another example of how bedtimes and wake up times can affect this is if you were to sleep in. So imagine if you sleep in, you get maybe more sleep than you normally would. And then you have less daytime hours across the day to build up your sleep pressure. This can mean that by the time you get to your usual bedtime, you perhaps don't have as much sleep pressure or sleepiness as you normally would. And that can explain why on those nights you can have a harder time falling asleep. It's because your body's not physiologically sleepy enough to be able to fall asleep yet. The other thing that can impact um, sleep homeostasis is napping. So this is perhaps an unhelpful um, behavior for some people. So in the dashed line, you can see what happens if you had a nap, for example, at 6 p.m. Um, the nap has paid back some of this um, sleep debt or sleep pressure. And even though after the nap, you still have maybe a few hours before your normal bedtime to build up that sleepiness again, you can see when it comes to bedtime, you're nowhere near the same level um, of sleepiness or you have nowhere near this amount of sleep pressure that you need to be able to fall asleep and stay asleep. So that can be an example of why napping, particularly late in the day, can impact upon your nighttime sleep. Any qu yeah, question? Sorry. In terms of napping, if um, napping is actually a, a way to keep you going during the, throughout the day, mm -hmm. um, what time would you say that is the best time for a nap? Basically with napping, the key, I'll, I'll give some key, I'll give some recommendations a little bit later on, but with napping, um, essentially what you want to do is keep it as brief as possible. So, um, yeah, 20 minutes. So that's surprising to a lot of people, just how brief that window is. And the reason behind that, um, today I'm not going to go too much into sleep architecture and how you go through light and deep stages of sleep, but essentially by keeping that window nice and short, it means that it's not long enough for you to get into deep sleep. Because when you get into deep sleep, you end up um, feeling more groggy as a result of napping. And that deep sleep is what most effectively pays back this sort of sleep pressure. So if you just have a 20 minute nap, you're just having a bit of light sleep, it doesn't um, alleviate sleep pressure sort of too much. And the other benefit is that it gives you that real alerting effect almost immediately. Whereas if you nap for longer and you spend time in deep sleep, you have that sort of hangover groggy effect. And it maybe you do feel better eventually, but it takes you an hour to feel better. Uh, yeah. But around yeah, the timing of napping, I think I've got some um, points on that a little bit later. <laughs> Any other questions so far? Um, so the other process in the two pro process model of sleep is the circadian system. So you can refer to this as process C or the better, easier way of looking at it is um, the body clock, essentially. So as a sleep psychologist, um, the key processes that I think about when I'm um, thinking about the body clock is your melatonin rhythm and your core body temperature rhythm. So who's heard of melatonin before? Most people. So I think everyone would know that that's sort of your sleepy hormone, your sleep promote, promoting hormone. Um, Basically, uh, melatonin is almost 
uh, entirely absent in our body during the day. So when our eyes are exposed to light, it sends a message to our body clock and our brain that it's time to be awake and it shuts down melatonin. So you can't find it in your system during the day. And then when the sun goes down, it starts getting dark at night, normally about two hours before your usual bedtime, your body will start sort of producing and releasing melatonin um, through the system. And so it's this slight sort of increase in our melatonin that helps us to feel prepared for sleep and helps us to fall asleep. And you can see levels keep rising across the night um, and then dissipate towards the end of the night when the sun comes up and our eyes are exposed to light again. So it's that rise in melatonin that helps us to fall asleep and as it continues rising, it helps us to stay asleep across the night as well. So melatonin, I guess, has a direct impact on our levels of sleepiness, but it also has an effect in our core body temperature rhythm. So as melatonin increases in the evening, it has this effect of slightly cooling our internal temperature or our core body temperature. And what you'll probably find if you look closely enough is that your levels of alertness and sleepiness across the day quite closely follow what's happening to our core body temperature rhythm. Um, so yeah. Basically, as melatonin increases, we have a slight cooling of our body. This is also um, the cooling process um, is sort of hastened by moving from sitting up or standing up to moving more into a sort of prone position. So lying down, it helps us, our body to cool a little bit. Um, this cooling is only about a degree or so. So while I've made this change look quite severe kind of across the 24 hour day here. Um, our body only cools by about a degree or so and it's this cooling of the body that helps us to fall asleep at the start of the night and to stay asleep. And as melatonin shuts down and as we get out of bed and stand up, our body kind of warms up again and that helps us to feel more alert. Um, so you might notice there's a bit of a dip here in the afternoon in our core body temperature and this is called the post-lunch dip. So it actually has nothing to do with lunch or eating and digesting food. It's just there are some people um, who are called dippers that have a slight dip in their core body temperature rhythm, maybe around 3, 3.30. And this is why we get this sort of 3.30-itis feeling where you're feeling a bit dozy around that time of the day. It's because our body has a slight cooling. Any questions about that? So developmentally what happens and um, something that affects a lot of younger university students is that circadian timing tends to drift later from the onset of puberty. Um, and so this means that um, physiologically you don't feel ready to go to bed until later and you also want to sleep in until later because your whole biological rhythm is sort of drifting later. And this sleep timing continues to drift later until about 21, 22 years of age. And in that case, then that risk factor tends to ameliorate a little bit and people tend to move more towards earlier sleep timing again. And that pattern keeps happening right until um, older adulthood. You tend to sleep, go to bed earlier and wake up earlier the older that you get after that point. So I guess another key determinant of sleep is uh, sleep hygiene. Um, it's not always the most popular term um, uh, for this kind of concept, um, but you can think of it more as healthy sleep practices or habits. Um, so these are the practices or habits that promote or inhibit good sleep. And so there was this study that showed that the more that people knew about sleep hygiene practices, this meant that um, you tended to engage in those practices more. And then um, the more that you engaged in those practices, the better sleep quality that you had as a result. And particular practices that they at least empirically found were linked with good sleep quality were um, not having very variable sleep. So if you have a really regular bedtime and a wake up time and um, there's a lot of regularity in your sleep, that seems to promote better sleep quality. Uh, people who reported a lot of noise in their environment, so say if you are living with flatmates and they tend to be quite noisy, that's something that would then impair sleep quality. Um, there are also physiological kind of things that you need to be aware of. So if you have discomfort in your body or you're going to bed when you're thirsty or hungry and things like that, that can impair good sleep quality. And the other thing that was linked was um, worry about sleep. So if you tend to worry a lot about your sleep, that's linked to having worse sleep quality. Okay, so what type of sleep problems are there? So I've referred to insomnia a bit so far, but what actually is insomnia? Well, insomnia is a common sleep disorder and it's made up of a number of different nighttime symptoms. And it could be one of these three symptoms or any combination of these symptoms. So when an individual has insomnia, they typically report having either difficulty falling asleep, 
difficulty maintaining sleep, so having lots of nighttime awakenings and having a hard time falling back asleep, or waking earlier than desired. So for example, if you want to wake up at 7 a.m., but often you're waking up at 5 a.m. and you're just not able to get back to sleep again after that. So it could be any um, combination of these symptoms or just one of these symptoms. And for a diagnosis of insomnia, you would not only need to have the nighttime sleep complaint, but you would need to have some sort of daytime consequence of your nighttime sleep. So reporting that you feel really fatigued or sleepy, that it's impacting you at university or impacting your ability to make and maintain friendships and things like that. Uh, also for a diagnosis, um, there is a sort of acute insomnia, which is more of a short-term condition. But for chronic insomnia disorder, we would want to see these things happening at least three times a week over three months for that um, diagnosis. Um, even if it doesn't meet that threshold, the treatments that we have for chronic insomnia disorder still work the same way for more of an acute problem. Um, another uh, sleep disorder that I'm interested in a lot with my research is called delayed sleep wake phase disorder. So this is a circadian rhythm sleep disorder. So it's more a result of um, process C or the circadian system that I mentioned earlier. So basically you'll notice in this figure um, for delayed sleep wake phase disorder, um, it looks very much the same as that developmental shift that happens with your body clock kind of drifting later. But for individuals with this sleep disorder, the body clock is delayed even more substantially. So normally sort of two hours or more later than when you want your body clock to be timed. And so what this results in is um, difficulty falling asleep. Um, so I guess your body clock is timed later. So physiologically, you're primed not to want to go to bed until later and to sleep in. But we still live in this 24-hour social world and you still have work and study commitments that are a bit more of this sort of nine to five society. So people feel pressure to go to bed earlier, even though they don't feel sort of prepared to sleep. And this can mean that they have a lot of difficulty falling asleep. And in these um, individuals with DSPD, typically would take, you know, an hour or two and maybe, you know, way longer than that. There are people who might be trying to fall asleep for five hours or so. Um, so difficulty falling asleep is a key symptom. The other key symptom is difficulty waking up and being able to meet your morning commitments. And this is because often to get up to go to uni or to get to work, in, these individuals are trying to wake up when they're at a real low point of the circadian rhythm. So when their body clock is most primed for sleep is often when their alarm is going off and they have to kind of get up and go to, go to class. So this can lead to just a lot of um, absences from school or from uni, um, maybe rocking up to work late and things like that. But if you are successful in kind of overriding a body clock and you do get up, um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of difficulty um, in doing that. And in doing that, you're often cutting the amount of sleep that you get short. So we see this pattern on weekdays where there's this chronic kind of sleep restriction. And then on weekends, we see the individuals sleep in a lot more. And partly that's because you're making up for all this lost sleep during the week. But the other reason for it is that you're able, um, without morning commitments, you're more able to sleep in line with your body clock. So if you're not forced to wake up for anything, you can just sleep um, when your body wants to sleep and wake up when it's sort of happy to wake up. So as a result of that, we see that if you're allowed to choose your own sleep timing, or if these individuals are able to choose their own sleep timing, they have better sleep quality and they get more sleep generally um, when that's um, possible. Any questions about Yeah, so, so if you're chronically sleep deprived, you're going to have sleep pressure. So that's the interesting thing, um, I guess, is that these two processes are always kind of interacting with each other as well. So yeah, you, you might have so much sleep pressure that you there might be some nights where you can fall asleep earlier, even though that's kind of out of kilter with where your body clock's um, sitting at. So you do definitely need to think about the two processes kind of fitting together. Um, but generally, once you've paid back that sleep debt, your body clock's still timed later. And then on the other nights, you'll probably find that you're going to sleep a lot later and waking up a lot later. Yeah. There is. Yeah. There are definitely ways that you can change the timing of your body clock. And so I don't um, have a lot of time to go into a lot of detail about exactly how we do that, but I'll mention some evidence-based approaches that we use to um, retime the body clock. 
Um, so yeah, that's definitely an approach. It is a tricky thing because then you're constantly kind of fighting against your own biology. Um, so it does take a lot of effort to kind of stick with those strategies kind of every day because even one day of sleeping in on a weekend can be enough to shift your body clock um, back again. So it is quite tricky, but we do have strategies, um, evidence-based strategies for that. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so these, um, they're just a couple of sleep disorders that I thought I would go into in a little bit more detail because they're most relevant to university students, but there's a whole range of other different sleep disorders that people might experience. So there are other circadian rhythm sleep disorders as well. There's a sleep disorder called advanced sleep wake phase disorder, and you can sort of imagine this is the complete opposite of delayed sleep wake phase disorder. It's when their body clock is timed too early to what they want it to be. This is more common in older adults, so they uh, you know, may be wanting to stay up later to watch their favorite TV show, but they're falling asleep way earlier than that and that means that they're waking up at like 4 a.m. even though they don't want to be waking up that earlier um, and in that example you would want to be moving their body clock later so that they can um, you know have a happier more fulfilling life. Um, there are other classes of sleep disorders though so there's sleep related breathing disorders so I think most people would have heard of things like sleep apnea before. Um, there are disorders of hypersomnolence, so this um, can be um, disorders related to excessive daytime sleepiness or things like narcolepsy. Um, there are also parasomnias, so these are sort of the sleep-related behaviours like sleepwalking, sleep talking, night terrors, and there are sleep-related movement disorders as well. So I think most people would have heard of things like restless legs or periodic limb movements, and it's those limb movements that can affect the quality of your sleep. Um, but these have sort of more of a medical sort of assessment and treatment component to them. And I guess I'm bringing my expertise as more of a sleep psychologist to this um, talk. So I won't really go into much detail about those other sleep disorders today. Okay, so what are some strategies to improve your sleep? Well, I'll first go through a bunch of these sort of sleep hygiene strategies. I'm sure a lot of these strategies you're familiar with already. Um, the first is to keep uh, regular bed and wake up times, even on weekends. So I know it's really, really tough <laughs> to do that on weekends because that's your opportunity to catch up on lost sleep. Um, but uh, yeah, having uh, really variable sleep times from day to day and from weekends to uh, weekdays means that your uh, sleep homeostasis um, so process S and process C aren't really very regulated. So your sleep loves that regularity to have really predictable bedtimes and wake up times. That means that you have the same number of hours every day to build up sleep pressure. It means that you're always going to bed at the right time of your body clock and always waking up at the right time for your body clock. So that regularity is really, really important. Uh, you should also try to reduce your exposure to bright light in the two hours before bed. Um, this is because bright light is what suppresses melatonin. So sort of two hours before your usual bedtime, your body is working really hard to produce melatonin to help you to feel ready for sleep. And if you have exposure to kind of really bright light over longer periods of time, this can prevent your body from naturally producing that melatonin or delaying the time that it's releasing melatonin into your system. Um, conversely then, on the other end, um, you should be spending as much time in bright light as possible. I know it's not always um, great on rainy days like today, there's not as much sunlight around, um, but if possible, try to get outside and get as much bright light as you can. So this means that that bright light will shut down your melatonin in the morning to help you, your body to warm up and to feel more alert. Um, and that just, that exposure to dim light in the evening and the bright light in the morning just helps to regulate your body clock and make sure it's sitting at the right time for you. So you should also try to make sure that you have wind down time at least an hour before bed. And this is because you need to have this or go through this process of cognitive and physiological de-arousal to prepare you for sleep. Um, if you're kind of really wound up in your body or you're having lots of sort of worries um, about things, um, that's almost like the antithesis of sleep. If, if you feel that way in your body and in your mind, it's not a state that's very conducive to sleep. So if you can try to wind down as much as possible before bed, that would be great. Um, you should try to avoid going to bed on a full or empty stomach. So making sure that you're physiologically, I guess, contented. 
uh, you should try not to spend too long in bed. So particularly with people who experience insomnia, it's really common that there's a belief that you just need to try harder. If I want to get more sleep, I should just spend longer in bed. But that's really counterintuitive because there's only a certain amount of sleep that your body can possibly get over a 24 hour um, time frame. And so often rather than getting more sleep, what that leads to is actually just more time spent awake in bed. That means that if you're spending longer in bed, um, you're not building up sleep pressure. Uh, it's better to be out of bed and to be building up that sleep pressure rather than just lying really sedentary and kind of saving your energy. Um, and it also creates this environment, particularly when it's dark and it's quiet, this is an environment that's conducive to repetitive negative thinking. So you might start thinking, oh, I can't believe that's the time. I, it's taking me forever to uh, fall asleep. That means that I'm only going to get this number of hours of sleep. Um, this will mean that I'll feel really groggy and terrible the next day and I'll perform you know, terribly in my presentation I have to give at uni. And so those worries then make it even less likely that you're going to be able to sleep because you go into kind of fight or flight mode um, in your body. Um, and I guess the other key point about that is that then uh, it's really important that your bed and bedroom environment is associated with sleep and sleepiness. And if, you, if it then becomes this environment that's just associated with feeling really frustrated about sleep and not being able to sleep, you're conditioning the environment to be one that's associated more with feelings of anxiety rather than feelings of good sleep. So um, one key tip um, that comes from stimulus control therapy, which I'll tell you about in a second, is to get out of bed after um, 20 minutes if you haven't fallen asleep. So you don't need to know to the exact minute how long it's sort of taking you, but if you feel like, oh, I've probably been lying here for 20 minutes and I haven't got to sleep yet, it's better to get out of bed, go to another room or a comfy chair, maybe just do some reading or something quietly um, until you feel ready or tired enough to try to sleep again. And this prevents you from just lying in bed worrying, essentially. Um, so you should try to avoid having distracting things in the bedroom. So if you can kind of keep your phone away from you, I know particularly if it takes you a while to fall asleep, you're probably pretty tempted to pick it up and scroll on social media or something, but that, um, that can be uh, sort of unhelpful for your sleep. And to try to keep your bed and bedroom only for sleep as well. Um, so that means, yeah, not doing homework on your bed, not eating in your bed or bedroom environment and doing other things there. Um, so where possible, don't cancel daytime activities. It's also quite common for people with insomnia to say, oh, I've had a rubbish sleep, I'm going to cancel this um, catch up I'm going to have with someone or I'm going to cancel that appointment. And that leads you to having a really kind of unfulfilling day. And if you try to conserve your energy, that means that you're not building up enough sleep pressure to be able to sleep well the next day. Um, so where possible, um, plan an active rewarding day with lots of time outside in sunlight. Uh, for the reasons I've mentioned before, also try to avoid napping, um, so you keep it brief and early. So there isn't a set cutoff that I have on the slide in terms of what time you should cut off naps, but basically the earlier in the day, the better. Um, and yeah, just keep it very, very brief. So yeah, particularly if you're feeling very sleepy and you need to drive somewhere or something, I would always recommend having a brief nap to keep yourself safe so that you're not driving when you're sleepy or anything like that. But um, yeah, try to minimize naps where possible as early as possible. I think, um, yeah, so the question was, um, there's, a, I guess, more of like an old wives tale or something like sleep before, if you're going to nap, do it before 3 p.m. I think that doesn't capture the individuality in the way that everyone sleeps. Even within the room, you'd, there'd be a huge variability in bedtime. Some people go to bed a lot earlier, some people go to bed a lot later. And so a 3 p.m. cutoff is a bit arbitrary. Um, I guess you want enough hours before your usual bedtime that you still have enough time to build up that sleep pressure again. Um, but certainly, I guess, in the first half of the day, if you can try, in your first half of your day, um, try it and keep napping kind of there rather than in the second half of your day. Yeah. I've got some questions, but yep. should we just keep going? I can um, finish this up and then yeah. we can do the Q&A. Yeah. Yep. Um, so avoid caffeine close to bed. So this is sort of three to seven hours before bed. There's a bit of individual variability in how sensitive you are to caffeine as well. Um, so I don't think I'm someone that's particularly um, sensitive to caffeine. Um, but there are other people who are sort of like, no, I can't, after midday, I can't have coffee. Um, otherwise, it'll keep me up at night. Um, same goes for things like um, nicotine from cigarettes. 
Um, in terms of alcohol, alcohol is often used to aid sleep onset, so it can help you to fall asleep more quickly, but it actually leads to a more disrupted sleep throughout the night. So even though you get to sleep more quickly, you're likely to have more time, nighttime awakenings and be awake for longer in the night, so it actually has an effect of decreasing your sleep quality. Uh, make sure your sleep environment is comfortable, dark, quiet, and a good temperature, and avoid having a clock that you can look at in the room, because often that just fuels that worry about why am I not asleep yet, how much sleep am I going to get before I have to get up in the morning and things like that. And try to have some strategies that work for you for quietening your mind if you feel like there is a lot of worry going on. So um, different strategies work for different people. You might like to look at relaxation strategies, imagery based work or some sort of mindfulness meditation, guided meditation. Um, but basically create a routine that works for you and stick to it. So there is a really robust relationship between sleep hygiene and, um, and good sleep. And because of that, there have been these different interventions that have been developed that target sleep hygiene um, behaviors. There is li limited sort of or mixed evidence for the efficacy of those sorts of interventions and in university students as well. And I would say that if you have a sort of diagnosable sleep disorder, sleep hygiene practices in themselves are not going to be enough to improve your sleep. So what evidence-based treatments do we have? Well, for insomnia, um, the first line recommended treatment for insomnia is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. I guess if you present to a GP, unfortunately, the first treatment that's often prescribed is medication, um, but really you should be um, getting a referral to a psychologist who has particular expertise in cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. So this is a multi-component treatment that's combined of lots of different things, and some of those um, standalone treatments um, are recommended in their own right as well. So this includes things like stimulus control therapy. So this is um, a set of rules that you follow essentially. So for example, if you're not asleep within 20 minutes, get out of bed and then go back to bed when you're ready to try again. And the aim of this therapy is to try and repair that relationship between the bed and bedroom environment and feelings of sleepiness rather than feelings of anxiety and worry. We also use sleep restriction therapy, which is a very scary sounding um, treatment, but it's very effective. Uh, really what that involves is temporar temporarily adjusting your bed and wake up times so that you spend the amount of time in bed that you think you actually spend asleep. So if you think you're in bed for about nine hours, but you only spend seven of those hours asleep, we would temporarily um, restrict your time in bed to only being seven hours so that you fall asleep quickly and stay asleep um, across the night. And once you're spending most of your time in bed asleep, we'll generally um, gently kind of relax those bedtimes again to give you a larger bedtime window. And then there are other strategies like relaxation therapy. Um, with the clinical practice guidelines I've taken this from, they do say that sleep hygiene isn't re recommended as a single component for treatment for insomnia. With delayed sleep wake phase disorder, treatments then um, target the circadian rhythm more so. And so uh, we can use strategically timed melatonin. Obviously, melatonin is a hormone that your body naturally produces, but um, we can use um, exogenous melatonin and give that at a particular time, and it has a hook and pull effect. So if you have um, melatonin, say, three hours before you would normally go to bed, it kind of hooks onto your normal melatonin rhythm, and then you can move the time that you take melatonin earlier every day, and it pulls your body clock earlier over time. And then um, because light suppresses melatonin, you can use light at the other side of your sleep period um, so that once you wake up, you expose the eyes to light and that shuts down melatonin. And if you move your wake up time and the time that you're exposed to light gradually earlier, that has the effect of pushing the body clock earlier again over time. So bright light therapy is combined with behavioral treatments and that basically means that we will schedule out when you go to bed and when you wake up over treatment to move the body clock earlier. So the timing of both of these things is really, really important. So although you might be able to try um, these sort of strategies yourself, I would recommend getting an adequately trained um, sleep psychologist involved so that they can do that planning with you. So in terms of where to seek help, there's um, different places on campus. So you can scan the QR code if you want, and that's more of an exhaustive list of the different resources that are available um, to you, um, including the Robin Winkler Clinic um, that's part of the School of Psychological Science. Um, there are also supports off campus, so you can go to the Australian Psychological Association. They have a Find a Psychologist tool. Um, basically, you can put in the region that you live in and what you're looking for. So tick like a sleep tick box and you can find what psychologist in your area could help you with your sleep. 
The Sleep Health Foundation has a lot of really uh, great information and information sheets you can access as well. But otherwise, I would recommend speaking to your general practitioner or your physician um, that you generally see and they can make a referral to the right health professional. So just to finish, um, I'll briefly mention good night poor sleep. Um, so this is the really kind of novel sleep intervention that is offered here at UWA. So I guess to university students, um, the cost of treatment, the length of treatment and not wanting to speak to a stuffy old health professional prevent people from seeking help for their sleep. So um, uh, the wonderful people at the Health Promotions Unit and some academics in the School of Psychological Science developed a really brief 15 minute peer led sleep intervention that's run through the Health Promotions Unit. If you did want help with your sleep, I believe they're running that intervention in drop-in services on Tuesday next week from Shenton House. So if you want help with your sleep, you could um, receive good night poor sleep on Tuesday. Um, otherwise, if you're interested in learning about poor sleep and helping people with their sleep, you can also be a peer educator as part of that program as well. So you can scan that QR code if you wanted to kind of um, register your interest in being a peer educator. Um, it's obviously a great learning opportunity, particularly for people who are studying psychology, who want experience kind of delivering interventions or people who are studying other sort of allied health um, professions as well. And you get your volunteer hours added to your transcript, which is um, fantastic. So you can scan the QR code or contact the health promotions um, team through email. I realized that we've sort of gone to the 45 minutes. so. I'm happy to stay around and answer questions, but I know people might need to start filtering out if you've got classes and stuff to go to. Yeah. Um, you spoke a lot about like, obviously light and mm. how that impacts your circadian rhythm. Yep. So I'm wondering like what your opinion or what the research says about wearing eye masks. To sleep. Yeah. Yeah. What's the research about eye masks? I actually don't know what, I don't know what the literature says about wearing eye masks. Um, I think it can be maybe particularly helpful for people who have an environment that isn't dark. So if you have like really light street lamps and things like that, that might be helpful. I think generally with the sun going down, it's sort of dark enough as long as you don't have overhead lights on in your room when you're trying to sleep and stuff like that. Generally, probably your environment is going to be dark enough to um, promote regulation of your body clock. But if you've got yeah particularly light bedroom or something like that, I would consider using a... Um, an eye mask and similarly if you've got lots of noises going on maybe sleeping with um uh what are they earbuds sort of in yeah yep yep um, many years ago i had an eczema and so i'm, I'm still undergoing rehabilitation mm -hmm. um as part of that i exercise a lot yep. um and so two days a week i wake up at five five o'clock mm -hmm. yeah very early in the morning yeah and so what i've noticed is push my night time sleep times back Mm -hmm. So you go to bed earlier on those yeah. days? Yeah. yeah. What, what are, like, is there anything else you recommend? Um, to, um, to, yeah, to compensate for the bad sleep that you're going to have? Are you able to sleep? If you go to bed earlier, you can sleep all right? Or does it take you longer to fall asleep on those nights? Longer, but yeah. um, then uh, waking up early isn't an issue because you're just like, I get a bit annoyed that I can't mm -hmm. sleep. Yeah. And then my alarm goes off at 4.50 and it's like, yeah. Fine. Yeah. I guess trying to avoid as much variability as you can up to sort of maybe a couple of hours is okay. Or maybe up to about an hour variability across yeah. the week is all right. More than that, you might want to think about adjusting things to bring your bedtimes and wake up times closer together. I think particularly... Um, if you're getting up ungodly sort of earlier than you normally would um, and you don't want to expose your eyes to light at that time, sometimes you can think about wearing sunnies or something in the morning if you don't want to give your body clock the hint that it's time to be early, uh, awake that early. Yeah. Um, so thinking about light exposure and things like that. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah. In the airports, I know a lot of people use uh, white marks to mm. actually decrease the quality of sleep if there was light listening. Again, I'm not sure about the evidence base um, around that. I think if if you're the type of person who gets very distracted about hearing like any noise in the environment, maybe it's better to have something like white noise so you're not engaging with getting annoyed at hearing your neighbours making noise or whatever it might be. In terms of actually like just white noise or earbuds. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, you could design a study yourself to kind of test that. <laughs> yep. Um, with this Mm -hmm. they more of an environmental stimulus, or they, um, more so, 
so they um, you can there's a genetic component to it so we there's um, also period length genes that we have that determine how long your body clock is so if you are genetically predisposed to having a longer body clock um, then that can predispose you to things like delayed sleep weight based disorder because you're constantly fighting against your kind of long body clock to fit with our 24-hour day so there's definitely a genetic component there but a lot of um, my research has been looking more at the psychological kind of elements to it as well um, so, and there are also like personality factors as well um, that are kind of linked to it. So there are a whole range of different um, contributing factors, but partly it's sort of genetic and biological. Um, and partly there are psychological factors that contribute to that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you take, you know, medication mm -hmm. for symptoms and then need to take sleep and cover to the effect that mm -hmm. it has on your sleep, mm -hmm. I think what you want to be thinking about is how you feel during the day. So the reason, I mean, one of the key reasons that we sleep is to kind of restore the body and things like that, but we sleep so that we can feel good and function well during the day. So if you feel like you're functioning great during the day, probably not an issue. If you feel like you're very, very sleepy, it's hard to pay attention and things like that, then it might be something that's worth um, asking health professionals about a little bit more. So it's not like the sleeping habits are impeding on your ability to get to a certain sleep level that... It can, certain medications... Yeah, certain medications can have a, an effect on your sort of sleep architecture, so how much of each stage of sleep you're getting, for example, but that varies um, depending upon the type of medication, probably based on dosage and things like that as well. So it'd be good to get more of an individual, individualised look with your kind of GP at what's what's going on. And yeah. Yep. Yep. What was what, sorry? REM. So um, REM sleep is a stage of sleep. So you basically pass through light and deep stages of sleep. You don't spend, a lot of people think that you go into deep sleep, you spend most of your night there and then you get back up through light stages of sleep again, but that's not at all what happens. You cycle through light and deep sleep across the night. And when you return into a lighter stage of sleep, you often either wake up or have a pocket of REM or both. Um, and so you get more REM sleep across the latter half of the night than you do at the start of the night. Most of the start of the night is paying back that sleep debt and you spend most of your time in deep sleep. Um, so REM sleep is really important for learning and memory and also for processing emotional information. So sleep sometimes is referred to as like an overnight therapy. So you could be really emotionally wound up by something and just sleeping on it makes you feel very different about it the next day. And that's because REM sleep helps you to process those emotional memories. Um, so you encode the learning from that, but it takes away that effective tone. It takes away the strength of the kind of emotions that you hold about a situation. So, so Um, yeah, REM sleep is more of an active kind of stage of sleep and so your brain waves look more like a light stage of sleep or more even like wake. Um, yeah. Someone suggested this to me, so like people wake up with alarms, mm -hmm. so they were like the time you want to wake up, let's say you want to wake up at 8 o'clock, you mm -hmm. set up an alarm at 7 o'clock and then you just have to wake up and snooze that off mm -hmm. so that you get one hour extra REM sleep. So. There are, <laughs> there are different um, technologies that I guess try to work out what stage of sleep you're in um, and wake you up out of a better stage of sleep. It's going to feel better waking up out of a light stage of sleep than waking up when you're in a really deep sleep. Um, so yeah, I don't think that there's any, I don't think I would be setting an alarm and then snoozing because um, yeah. <laughs> I think <laughs> if you need that to get up and, and get to class on time, I would do it. But generally, I would recommend having a better quality sleep and waking up when you need to rather than preempting an hour earlier than you actually need to be awake and then just breaking your sleep, like having those awakenings for the hour before you need to get up. Um, so I'm happy to stay around and um, answer more questions, but I think we need to wrap up. And so um, you can give me feedback on what you thought about the event by scanning the QR code on the right hand side. You can scan this QR code to get more information about services. Um, but yeah, please come up with the questions. I'll hang around for a while. Thank you.
could have gone up somewhere else. I know. People were like really interested. Being like recorded. It is. Oh, amazing. Yeah. So I don't think I'd be able to make it.